Hi everyone, this is Peter Beal. Uh, once again, coming back to the topic of cubism. And this time I want to move into cubism proper, basically what uh, historians of <clears throat> modern art describe as analytic cubism. In the previous uh, talk, I went over some of the features of Picasso's very important 1907 painting, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. <clears throat> I talked about the way in which it echoed uh, some of the precedents of the past in terms of it being a large uh, figural grouping. This is something that, for instance, uh, Cezanne uh, did, uh, Renoir did, uh, to take some more contemporary uh, painters. Um, we have the controversial group of the Dejeuner Solaire of Manet. <clears throat> and of course, we have many, many other examples in a kind of more quote unquote traditional or academic uh, mode, such as uh, the paintings of uh, Bouguereau, or even uh, going all the way back to the likes of Titian or Giorgione from the 16th century Venetian tradition. We talked a little bit, of course, about how. Um, Picasso quite conscientiously tried to um, erase uh, that tradition, even as he acknowledged it, uh, by focusing especially on two-dimensionality, uh, the use of flat planes of color, and uh, these jagged and irregular uh, outlines and forms instead of more modeled uh, organic curves. In this talk, uh, I want to just move forward to uh, look at the development of analytic cubism uh, proper. And I think we can see right away, using this example by uh, Georges Brock, the Portuguese of 1911, so a few years after um, uh, the Demoiselle, uh, just how radically <clears throat> Brock and Picasso changed uh, the direction of painting. And, um, and I, I definitely would argue that this movement uh, has a strikingly long afterlife uh, and the intellectual concepts that sort of uh, underlay it are for the most part very much alive really even into the present age when we talk about when we talk about contemporary art some of that's going on for sure um picasso and probably i think uh understandably uh, so did not uh, share the demoiselle uh, as a painting extensively with other people. It's not exhibited, for instance, until quite a bit after it's painted. And that's hardly surprising. Uh, again, the radical revision of seemingly traditional subject matter and uh, that adding on of the so-called primitive elements in those masks that, um, you know, that uh, exposure, I guess, in Paris uh, at the time that that Picasso's living there, to um, uh, the visual culture of faraway um, uh, places in Africa and elsewhere. Um, all these things, I think, made this a, a pretty radically uh, difficult uh, piece of work. So it's it's understandable that he would have set that to one side. Um, it, it seems that at some point, uh, Georges Braque, who's a, a close friend of Picasso at the time, and Picasso, decided to take some of the ideas that are inherent in uh, the Demoiselle painting and see where else uh, they can be taken. And again, it's a very interesting thing because the subject matters of the kinds of things portrayed, so to speak, in analytic cubism are actually quite conventional. Again, following that precedent of the um, of the Demoiselle. But it's clear that the intellectual component of the painting is really the most important aspect. There are lots of ways in which the artists, both of them, in a sense, played a kind of game with the ideas, conventions, assumptions uh, involved in painting, and, and quite self-consciously did that. Uh, there's this sense that um, and, and we start seeing quotes, uh, a, a good example from a, a Pablo Picasso, I paint forms as I think them, not as I see them. So this is very different, for instance, from Claude Monet, who, you know, tells his student, you know, you see a little pink square, paint a little pink square. That's not what's going to happen in cubism. It's, a, again, and especially with that word analytic, so to break down 
look closely at the components uh, of something and then reassemble it and um, kind of comprehensively understand it. That's a very cerebral and intellectual approach, uh, intellectual approach to art. Um, it's also, and I think this echoes um, contemporary developments in the sciences. Uh, we have to remember that right around this time, Albert Einstein is putting out his general theory of relativity, which destabilizes concepts of space and time. It's difficult to say that Picasso was well aware of this. I mean, closely aware, certainly he's not a you know professional physicist or anything like that. Um, but other things are destabilizing uh, the nature of visual reality. And, and I mean, you could argue the impressionists basically do the same thing. But but again, this is much more focused and you know almost like a laboratory. Um, and um, what other types of things are going on? Well, we're talking, for instance, around this time, Sigmund Freud, who is, in essence, postulating that human beings, psychologically speaking, are really, in a sense, fragmented. There are lots and lots of ways in which we are multiple personalities, I suppose. We have our ego, we have our id. Um, the idea, kind of from the Enlightenment, that a Individual is a single rational thinking presence, a Cartesian thing, for instance. That's uh, viewed by many leading thinkers of this turn of the century period as you know, hopeless, hopelessly obsolete. Um, again, the physical sciences have uh, been under the impact of uh, under the impact of, of Darwin. Sorry, the biological sciences, physical sciences. Um, certainly, Einstein takes apart the Newtonian uh, relatively stable understandings of time and space. Uh, where else? Well, we've had 50 years of um, political turmoil following, uh, to take the example of Karl Marx, 1848, and um, his um, Communist Manifesto, for instance, and then his descriptions in Das Kapital and elsewhere, and I think the phrase is Marx's, although I think he's borrowing it from Shakespeare, that all that is solid melts into thin air. So the institutions that had stabilized uh, European culture for you know, if if not centuries, certainly at least decades, were now uh, coming undone. And uh, most spectacularly, if we look at 1911, uh, does this uh, does this herald, in some sense, the massive calamity that's the you know the First World War? You know, we'll, we can't definitively say that, but there's no question that if we looked at analytic cubism, the sense of a kind of serene, peaceful, stable, harmonious reality is not. That's not the primary goal. So what's going on in uh, in the Portuguese? Let's look at this really quickly. So the subject, again, is very traditional. It's a musician uh, playing on, and you can sort of get some sense of this, playing on a guitar. You can get the sound hole and the, perhaps the strings coming across and you know, maybe a kind of headstock thing. So there's kind of this motif of a guitar. And then if you follow that logic, then there's kind of a torso here and then a head. Right, so it's a, it's a very traditional uh, subject. Going back again to the time of the Venetians, uh, we see images of people playing uh, musical instruments, and it's a you know a staple of a kind of genre art ever since. So so what's going on here though is it's very clear that that's not really the subject. That we're not given enough clues to kind of really go into it. That there's in a, in a kind of funny way, and echoing the demoiselle, a series of little walls or flat, planar areas that deflect our gaze, that don't let us develop the subject in terms of three dimensions, that the artist has taken viewing and offered us these multiple and multiple, multiple vantage points um, and fragments or f fractions of those multiple uh, viewpoints, and then kind of patch them back together the way you could argue the act of seeing uh, does, patches them back together to create a constantly deferred uh, visual reality. You never complete the act of seeing with a cubist painting. There's always something. And indeed, the application of paint, you can see this very clearly with lots and lots of thick, individually distinct kind of staccato brush strokes, each making kind of like a mosaic, its own little painting. Um, so so this is kind of interesting. There's a, a statement, I think it's 
along these lines. Oh, I think it was about Picasso, but it'll do. Just the general sense that these artists looked at art with the first four lines being um, of the of the painting being the perimeter of the canvas, right? So you have the you know the two two on the side and then two on top, and then kind of within that field defined by those lines, you start finding lots and lots of little lines and even little fields, right? These brush strokes. So it's a constantly moving, but it's not shimmering or, um, you know, brilliantly colorful the way that Seurat, for instance, might have done. This is done in a deliberately monochrome and subdued, with a deliberately monochrome and subdued um, a palette, emphasizing grays and browns and, and things like that. To make things more complicated, we can see that the artist has included these these um, bits and pieces of numbers and letters forming parts of words. And again, there's a little bit of a you know mystery as to why those are there. Perhaps like a you know a musician might be in a I don't know a nightclub or a small concert hall. And there might be posters for that performance or other performances like that. Um, it also, though, you could, I think, look at it a couple of other different ways. One of them is that text invites reading. But reading, and I, this is going to really take off by the end of the 20th century, but certainly I think there are hints of it at this point in time. Reading is a complex and difficult and, again, incomplete thing. Okay, there's any number of potential interpretations, and it's always a little bit... Um, What's the right word? Unfinished, I guess. Cut off, fragmentary. And so when Brock puts in these fragmentary bits and pieces of text, he's, I would argue, kind of encouraging us to think in those terms. You know, read this painting, try to figure out what's going on, but you're never going to actually get it. Um, but it's, and that's because it's not possible to get it. That, you know, it's an illusion to think that you're going to understand really any painting. Okay, and this is made clear in the in the cubist mode. The other thing that goes on with these um, these bits and pieces of text and number and what, numbers and what have you is that they emphasize that two dimensional quality, right? So so printing on a flat say piece of paper um, this certainly works a hundred percent against any notion of a compl of a complete or coherent a uh, pictorial space, the kind that you know, for instance, Italian Renaissance artists were dedicating themselves to creating. So the insertion of text so prominently, but in such a fragmentary and ambiguous uh, fashion, really helps underscore these aspects of Cubist uh, art. And what are these aspects? Well, again, let's summarize really quickly. Typically, Cubist art is of an ordinary subject, sometimes landscape, but oftentimes still life or portraiture relatively still. Motion and cubism don't work too well together. The motion is really in the painting. And the artist looks at the really infinite number of viewpoints and starts picking and choosing from them and creates, if you will, almost like a kind of like series of index cards or something like this, They're like multiple prints of a uh, somewhere with a camera just firing off lots and lots of them and then reassembling them, right? in a very complex and confusing space that is simultaneously a little bit three-dimensional and a lot bit two-dimensional. And then invites us to consider what our seeing is, what it looks like. And again, the Portuguese is a, is a great example. Now for the next and final uh, part of this introduction to cubism, we'll look at a, another mode of cubism, which really is also very influential, and that is one based on assembly, of finding elements out there and using those to create a work of art, undermining uh, many of the traditional assumptions about artistic craft, um, expression, and so forth. So that's going to be the next, uh, the next talk. See you then.